Well, President Joe Biden won by the biggest margin in the New Hampshire primary last night with 66 percent of the vote to his challengers, 20 percent. Joe Biden's 46 point winning margin was achieved without the president campaigning in New Hampshire for even one day. Joe Biden's 46 point winning margin, four times as big as Donald Trump's winning margin, was achieved without bothering New Hampshire voters with a single invasive television commercial in their living rooms. And for Joe Biden to win 66 percent of the vote in the New Hampshire primary required 66 percent of the voters in the Democratic presidential primary to write in the name Joe Biden. That's right. Joe Biden won 66 percent of the vote without even having his name on the ballot. Meanwhile, on the Republican side, Donald Trump had the lowest winning margin of any candidate in the history of the New Hampshire primary who has served as president of the United States and had his name on the New Hampshire primary ballot. Once again, and you should be accustomed to this by now, the polls were wrong. Donald Trump went into Election Day with a 20-point lead in the polls and ended up with half of that, a 10-point lead when all the votes were counted against his very strong challenger, Nikki Haley, who regarded her 43 percent of the vote as worthy of a victory speech. With Donald Trump, Republicans have lost almost every competitive election. We lost the Senate. We lost the House. We lost the White House. We lost in 2018. We lost in 2020. And we lost in 2022. The worst kept secret in politics is how badly the Democrats want to run against Donald Trump. Yes. Yes. Trump's a loser. He's a loser. They know Trump is the only Republican in the country who Joe Biden can defeat. You can't fix, you can't fix the mess. That obviously drove her opponent even crazier than he normally is. And so Donald Trump, when he showed up on the stage looking sweaty and unwell, seemed so thrown off of his game by Nikki Haley's attack speech to the point that he could not even complete the staff written victory speech that was in his teleprompter. He just gave up. And he turned around and he handed over the microphone to the losers he brought on stage with him who already dropped out of the Republican presidential primary campaign and endorsed Donald Trump. Conservative writer Matt Lewis in his column in The Daily Beast said, the party of Lincoln has metastasized into a decadent and perverse cult of personality that calls evil good and good evil. Nikki Haley, the former governor of South Carolina and former United Nations ambassador during the Trump administration, began her campaign day today in South Carolina, where the next presidential primary will be held next month. She came out swinging at Donald Trump once again. So we got out there and we did our thing and we said what we had to say. And then Donald Trump got out there and just threw a temper tantrum. <laughs> He pitched a fit. He was, he was insulting. He was doing what he does. But I know that's what he does when he's insecure. I know that's what he does when he is threatened. And he should feel threatened, without a doubt. Listen, we've only had two states that have voted. We got 48 more that deserve to vote. A presidential candidate has to get 1,215 delegates. Donald Trump has 32, and I have 17. <laughs> Out of everything that he said in his rant, he didn't talk about the American people once. He talked about revenge. Today, President Biden focused his campaigning on Donald Trump, the candidate who wants to repeal Obamacare. Obamacare enrollment hit a record high level today of more than 21 million people whose health insurance Donald Trump is vowing to take away. 
To a meeting of the United Auto Workers, President Biden said this. Foes, in fact, are attacking unions, leaving too many Americans behind. In fact, when Donald Trump was in office, six auto factories closed around the country. Tens of thousands of auto jobs were lost nationwide during Trump's presidency. During my presidency, we've opened 20 auto factories and more to come. We've created more than 250,000 auto jobs all across America. And here is what the president of the United Auto Workers, Sean Fain, said today in delivering the important United Auto Workers endorsement to President Biden. In 2019, our members were out there holding the line at GM on a national strike for 40 days. Trump was the sitting president. He said nothing, he did nothing, not a damn thing, because he doesn't care about the American worker. Now, here's what Trump did to help the American auto worker in our 2023 historic stand-up strike now that he's running for president. He went to a non-union plant, <laughs> invited by the boss, and trashed our union. That's right. And here is what Joe Biden did during our stand-up strike. He heard the call, and he stood up, and he showed up. He joined us in solidarity on the picket line for the first time in our nation's history. A sitting president has ever done that. He said on live national TV that the big three, and I quote, should go further to ensure that record corporate profits mean record contracts for the UAW and the workers. So that's a choice we face. It's not about who you like. It's not about your party. It's not this bullshit about age. It's not about anything but our best shot at taking back power for the working class. UAW! 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 Donald Trump is a scab. If Donald Trump ever worked in an auto plant, he wouldn't be a UAW member. He'd be a company man trying to squeeze the American worker. We are not going to break the media's obsession with polls, but we, I've been trying to help the viewer's understanding of polls. And so it, it, poll, polling over the years has faced a bunch of challenges. The answering yep. machine was the first big challenge that, yep. that pollsters would call home and a machine would answer. It would throw off the system. It took them, took them years to figure out how to deal with the answering machine problem. Then came cell phones. They didn't know how to poll cell phones at all for years yep. and years. Then they finally penetrated the cell phone. I'm just pointing that out to viewers. I know you know all of that. 
uh, yeah. just so they can understand that polling has been changing its techniques and its methods constantly in response to new developments. Trump right. is a new development. And it seems to me that Trump is a particular challenge for polling. And they're using their methods that end up showing Trump with a 20-point lead in New Hampshire. He gets a 10-point win. Uh, is there something in the polling of Trump that the media has to be very, very careful of? I just think in general right now, we learned in 2022 that if you center your understanding of American politics around polling, you're taking an extraordinary risk. Right. The polls did not actually predict or explain what was going to happen in the election. And I think we have to take all polling now with a grain of salt. I think part of what probably happened last night is that more independent voters probably showed up than many of the pollsters anticipated, That certainly, which could explain why he didn't do as well, because the independent voters tended to vote for Haley. Right. That would be an explanation. I don't really know that for sure. But I will tell you that in general, since Dobbs happened, and I really do, I begin to think that Dobbs may have broken the Republican Party in some ways, that the, even for the 20, 30 percent of Republicans who are not MAGA, it was just a bridge too far. It was too much. They couldn't handle it. And that the Republican Party now has even become deeply unattractive and ugly to Republican voters. And so since Dobbs in 2022, they've continued to struggle. They just aren't winning elections. They're not getting their voters to turn out. They're struggling in these early states. MAGA is a failed politics, as Nikki Haley, by the way, said. MAGA lost in 2018, 2020. And in the last two years, last we've done an extraordinary thing. The party in power always loses seats in modern American history. We gained ground in 2022. We gained ground in 2023. And that's because the most powerful force in our politics today is fear and opposition to MAGA. It's far more powerful than disappointment in Joe Biden and the Democrats. And the Republicans, you know, instead of running away from this politics, they're doubling down on what has been an absolutely failed politics in recent years. And I think Democrats should be optimistic about what, we're, what we can do in 2024. Congressman Frost, I want to begin with you because our audience knows you. I want you to introduce Representative Keene to this audience and tell us why you believe he won this race. Yeah, well, thanks so much for having us on, Lawrence. And, you know, this was a race, all eyes on Florida during this race, especially since the primary. And as soon as Tom won that primary, a three-way difficult primary to win, we went to work to help ensure that he had a great field program. And the thing about Tom is he's someone who's from the community. He's a Navy veteran. He is someone who's been fighting for these issues for a long time. But he really focused in on two things that people really cared about in the district, which is, I believe, the reason that he won abortion rights and ensuring that people have the right to an abortion and reproductive health and also the housing affordability crisis and homeowners insurance crisis that we have here in the state of Florida. Oftentimes in these campaigns, there's a tendency to talk about everything, which is important. And Tom has positions on every issue, but he really focused in on the things that people were really thinking about. And that's why he won. And that's why he won 65 to 70 percent of NPAs. And that's what we're going to take this message and this model that Tom had during his campaign, take it statewide, and work at bringing back the state of Florida. Representative Keene, you're looking at a, at a campaign that you had to launch for a seat that a Republican won by 11 points. What made you think you could do it? Well, good evening, Lawrence. Uh, thanks for having me on. I, I think I, I thought we could do it because I just barely lost in the primary uh, last year. I had some name recognition, and quite frankly, I think the issues that we ran on were the ones that resonated. We've seen it across the country. I saw that, and I thought it would work in Florida. Uh, as you go forward in the state legislature, what is your, uh, what, what's your agenda starting off? Well, right now, we want to make sure that the voters that put me in hear the issues that I talked about, reproductive freedom and the property insurance crisis that we have here in Florida. And quite frankly, uh, we have a supermajority, so I think I'll be focused principally right now on property insurance. I am uh, on the uh, banking and insurance uh, subcommittee, uh, which was a great committee for me to get as a uh, redshirt freshman. Uh, and we'll watch the Florida Supreme Court as they uh, 
they look at the Florida uh, Supreme Court looks at reproductive freedom, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, Congressman Frost, what did we learn about the possibilities uh, in November in Florida? You have a Senate race there, obviously the presidential campaign coming to Florida. Yeah, I think there's really two huge takeaways here from Tom's um, victory. Number one is the field program. Obviously, my campaign was working hard, knocking doors alongside Tom, uh, Tom. He had his own field program. But many other electeds in Central Florida put forward their volunteers to knock doors to get Tom elected. So I think what we saw is when we have a good field program that's knocking doors of, yes, Democrats, but also NPAs, we also knocked Republican doors. And I think that holistic approach to GOTV, get out the vote, is part of the reason that Tom won. The second thing is his message. And I know I met mentioned this before, but I want to say it again. When we hone in on what the people care about, what the people are thinking about in that moment, that's what drives people out to vote. And it was mentioned before this segment. The day of Election Day, there was actually more Republicans that voted than Democrats. So you take a step back and you realize, wow, it was the get out to vote effort during early vote and vote by mail that gave us the lead, that gave Tom the need he needed to go into Election Day and be able to absorb some of those Republican votes and take 65 to 70 percent of NPA. So it's really a testament to the fact that people shouldn't forget and shouldn't give up on the state of Florida. Tonight's last word goes to another Lawrence who works much harder than I do. Today, January 24th, is the International Day of Education, a day the United Nations says, quote, is dedicated to the crucial role of teaching and learning in promoting lasting peace. The United Nations has created, quote, a roadmap for rethinking and redesigning education systems to prepare learners to collectively shape more just, sustainable, healthy and peaceful futures for all. That is all a worthy and noble ambition for schools in this country and in many other countries around the world, but for millions of learners in some countries. First, they need a desk. Here is one of my new best friends in Malawi, Lawrence Namacha, who I met in his elementary school classroom in October, a school where none of the classrooms had desks. Like his classmates, Lawrence has never seen a desk in the classroom until we delivered desks that day, thanks to your generosity to the Kind Fund, Kids in Need of Desks, the partnership that I created between MSNBC and UNICEF to provide desks to schools in Malawi and to provide scholarships for girls to attend high school in Malawi, where public high school is not free and the girls' high school graduation rate is less than half the boys' graduation rate. After the thrill of helping to carry the desks into his classroom and sitting at a desk for the first time in his life, Lawrence told me what his years of sitting on the classroom floor were like. What was difficult about sitting on the floor before you had a desk? <laughs> You can make a contribution to the Kind Fund in any amount. No contribution is too small. You can give a desk as a birthday gift or a Valentine's Day gift in the name of anyone on your gift lists, and UNICEF will send them an acknowledgement of your gift. Thousands of you did this over the holiday season, contributing a total this year of $4,814,756, one of the biggest years ever for the Kind Fund. That brings the total you have so generously contributed over the 13 years we've been introducing you to students in Malawi to $44,182,000. $536. What will be better in your schoolwork because you have a desk? I asked him to put his feet on the moon. Then I remember that the moon was just my ponisa. That was the case of a desk, but I didn't have a proper moon. It was my ponisa. What did it feel like to sit at your desk today for the first time? Now, what we know is that we are not going to be able to do it. We are going to be able to do it. But you saw the moon, I keep. 